It's Thursday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. With me today, Conservative MP Matt Warman, SNP MP Stuart Hosey, Guardian columnist Polly Toynbee and Tim Stanley of The Daily Telegraph. Today, will the government do anything to tackle the cost of living? This cabinet minister wants planned tax rises to be scrapped. Are Tory MPs thinking what he's thinking? It's billed as the biggest change to farming in decades. Will the countryside look different in the future? Exactly a year since the storming of the Capitol in Washington, has America moved on? Four people are cleared of criminal damage after the toppling of this statue in Bristol. A travesty of justice or Britain coming to terms with its past? The real offence was that a statue to a mass murderer was allowed to stand for 125 years, not that that statue was toppled in the summer of 2020. People want to remove statues. There's a perfectly legitimate way to go about uh, doing that. And, uh, and, and, and that's why we live in a democracy, frankly. Hello. Well, we'll start with that last story about those four people being cleared of criminal damage after being accused of illegally removing a statue of slave trader Edward Colston. Now, that is on the front page of several papers. Let's take a look at some of them. The Bristol Post, its take, we didn't change history, we rectified it. But quite a different approach from the Daily Express, which I think we can take a look at. They say statue vandals cleared, but where will it all end? So I guess the question to the panel to start off with is, is this a green light for people to tear down statues for political reasons, Matt? Well, that's definitely the worry. I think this verdict sends a terrible signal. Obviously, in, in this case, the jury looked at it and, and that's the verdict they came to. I don't think this is particularly about this one case. But I do think if people start thinking the way to change our environment is simply to take matters into your own hands, that's a terrible sign. It sends a very bad signal. Um, I, I do think the other side to this, though, is that it's also a very bad thing that after years and years of protest against the Colston statue, nothing was done by local authorities. There is a legitimate mechanism to get statues removed, all that sort of stuff, um, and it was not taken up. That's a bad thing, but nonetheless, a good thing that the law is being changed in a forthcoming bill to stop this sort of thing happening in the future. Stuart, do you agree? It's not a precedent. Uh, I mean, the courts found the four defendants not guilty on a criminal damage charge. It's as simple as that. It's not a precedent. I think the fact that it was a jury trial that tells us something, and they were found not guilty. I think what it tells us is that the public are way ahead of where certain politicians are. I mean, if someone was to turn up to a local authority today and say, I want to erect a statue to a slave trader, they'd be given very short shrift indeed. The one thing I would say is, though, given the Daily Mail and uh, some Tory MPs are whining against this decision, uh, I suspect the courts have got it right. Tim, what do you think was on trial here? Was it the protesters or was it the statue itself? That's the interesting thing. Was it a question about criminal damage or was it a question about the morality of this particular toppling? Uh, Edward Colston was a horrible person. Uh, the statue was an offence to uh, moral dignity. Uh, I would be tempted to chuck it in the river myself. Uh, but it seems to me obvious that criminal damage was carried out. Uh, and it, it, it's surprising that this verdict could, could come to any other conclusion. Um, the, the problem is, you may well say this person was particularly bad, they deserve to be torn down, this is a, a moral victory that goes beyond the simple ma matter of property and criminal damage. But the question is, where do we stop? Some people truly believe Winston Churchill was a racist and an imperialist. So does that mean that his statues are a fair target? Does it mean that juries will take a, treat uh, the attempt to tear those down likely? Uh, you could do that with other figures like Baden-Powell. So it, it does set a very troubling precedent. Um, and I, I, I'm concerned, and you see this on both left and right, that when people convince themselves that their cause is morally just, and very often they're correct, 
they think they can go beyond the parameters of the law to get done what they want to get done. We're going to be discussing the Capitol Hill riot later on, I think. That's another example of it, of the right doing it. The left does it through protests and violent action as well. Okay. I would rather people stuck to the letter of the law and got things done and changed in a peaceful manner. Okay. Polly, is this a concerning precedent for you? Well, I think it's a great celebration of the importance of juries. We could have just have judges making uh, decisions of this kind. But in the end, if the law is an ass, if this particular case was right, the jury can step in and, as it were, overturn the law. Uh, I mean, it, plainly, it was criminal damage. But uh, on this occasion, you know, it was the right thing. Bristol felt so it, to a large degree. It was very good that they fished the, the statue out again. They put it in a museum. They put a sign on it to describe both the events that led to its destruction, but also what it was all about. And it led to a huge national discussion about things that were built and made and wealth that was created by slavery it didn't lead to a mass tearing down of statues i mean ages before some idiot once daubed a, a winston churchill statue to the great delight of the likes of uh, you know, the telegraph and the express and the mail and so on but actually nobody's <laughs> suggesting tearing down uh, winston churchill so let's keep it in proportion but i think what it's opened up in the way of talking about slavery no better place than bristol has been absolutely absolutely valuable beyond anything. Matt, the historian David Olasuga said that this was a milestone in the country's journey to come to terms with its past. Do you agree with that? So I think the removal of the statue and all the events that went around it certainly were a milestone, but I think the manner of its removal and to then for a, a, a jury to say that is OK. Um, Stuart's right, it doesn't set a, a legal precedent, but I do think the message that it sends is, is a really, uh, really, really bad one. And, and I simply think if you, uh, although Polly says people aren't tearing down st statues of Churchill, there are plenty of people that want to, and it doesn't take that many to physically do it. I think the idea that you might then do it and get away with it is something that I don't think anyone seriously in, in the mainstream disagrees with. There have do you to be think proper the jury ways would take this. the same view of pulling down a statue of Churchill? I doubt it. That's the value of a jury, is it? They make common sense out of it. No, and, and I don't disagree with you, but the, pro but the problem is not with the jury in that circumstance. The problem would be with the attitude that people may take in the tearing down of the statue. Is, is that sort of, You've got to deal with what this might cause rather than per se the fact that a jury came to a, an individual decision. Stuart, what's your take on that? Do you think that we might see other people feel like they've got more licence to act in the way they deem fit and make a political argument about it as a result? No, I, I think people will make a political argument. Uh, whether one statue or another should be removed. Uh, because there is no legal precedent, even in England, with this particular decision, I don't think this gives carte blanche for small groups of people to go tearing down statues. What it may do, though, is strengthen the resolve of people to campaign to have statues either removed or to put into museums or properly marked that these were not virtuous people. These were absolutely horrible creatures and, frankly, the context of the nasty, horrible stuff they did deserves to be reported so that youngsters can be educated about what was right and, indeed, what was wrong. I, I don't think it serves our history more generally to tear down statues and erase them from history. I think that retain and explain idea is something that allows us both to come to terms with that are the things that are part of the country's history, but also to understand them. I, I think there are people who have real problems, for instance, with the Statue of Clive of India not far away from uh, where we are here. That, okay. that could do with some explanation in my eyes as well. OK. Well, it's something we have spoken about, but there is another division emerging in the Conservative Party that has come to the fore overnight. Let's take a look at a story that's in the Financial Times today. It says, Boris Johnson pressed to scrap £12 billion tax rise amid cost of living crisis. This is Jacob Rees-Mogg, who the FT reports leads a growing Tory revolt against the planned increase in national insurance, which is due uh, to come in in April. Matt, do you think that Jacob Rees-Mogg has a point here? Well, I, I think uh, what's been reported is not what Jacob uh, sa says he said, and nonetheless he's bound Although by... Although his team haven't denied what's been reported. Uh, and, but, and, but also, Jacob, <coughs> as, as he's talked about extensively, is very much bound by collective responsibility. He, he's in the Cabinet, and the Cabinet has made that decision. I, I think there's a broader issue around the Conservatives as a party believe fundamentally in low taxes, but we also have to make sure that we pay for uh, the range of things that are primarily around COVID, but also around social care, around the NHS. So I think 
think there is a much broader conversation around what do we do around taxation in general, how do we tackle the cost of living, which is clearly uh, a rising issue. And some of your colleagues have real concerns about in, that. In, in, indeed, and, and, and rightly so. But I think the way to tackle that is to target the people who uh, need the help most, as we've done consistently over the course of the pandemic, rather than, uh, as the PM put it, to, to go for uh, the br to reach for the broadest brush at the first opportunity. Stuart, the SNP did not support, in fact, you voted against this plan rise in national insurance. So does that mean you agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg? I think we need to look at the whole context of this, and I'll come back to that specific question. Um, this is primarily driven by an increase in the cost of living, primarily driven by an increase in energy costs. Quite extraordinary. So there's a whole range of things which are on the table to help deal with that. Some people are talking about a, wind, a windfall tax on energy companies and traders. Some people are talking about removing some of the obligations on the power companies. Some people are suggesting the universal credit decrease was, in, was But just removed. to stick to the and point about NI, national insurance. Well, indeed, all of these things have to be looked at. But we're going to have to tackle this head on. And I suspect that actually means widening and deepening uh, the warm homes discount. But because that's paid by the taxpayer, the Treasury are going to have to step in to do that. Okay. Because we can't ask hard-working people... But just to, to come back to this national insurance people. point, because obviously the national insurance increase yeah. is designed to pay for the NHS yeah. and social care, and Scotland will get a proportion mm -hmm. of that funding. So you've voted against the national insurance increase, mm -hmm. but I presume you won't uh, deny yourselves the funding that comes with it. No, I mean, the funding we get as, part of, as being part of the UK at the moment, we get. The point we were making when we opposed the NI increase was it simply added an unnecessary burden at that point to people who have been struggling, to businesses who have been struggling, and we didn't think it made an awful lot of sense. But if we look at where the cost of living crisis is being driven from, which is energy costs, we need to tackle that specifically head on. And as I say, that probably means an increase, a deepening and a widening of the warm homes discount, but paid for by the Treasury, not by the consumer. OK, well, let's just look at those energy costs, because The Sun is looking at this today. There was a meeting yesterday between Business um, Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng and some uh, energy representatives, and The Sun says fat cat energy bosses demand £20 billion Treasury bailout to keep household bills down. Um, now, obviously, there are a range of options on the table here. Tim, what do you think needs to be done about this energy bill crisis? The government would rather, of course, they went for private or for bank loans rather than uh, government bailouts. Uh, what can we done about it? I have absolutely no idea. Uh, the problem from the perspective of Tory backbenchers is they feel that their own government is actually adding to the cost of living crisis, either through tax increases or through the rush towards uh, going net zero on carbon, uh, the costs of which are going to be inevitably passed on to the consumer. So that's where the, the tension comes from. Everyone understands that there is a, a gap in finance that's been caused by COVID, by lockdown. Everyone knows the NHS is under pressure and it needs more money. The debate, uh, insofar as there is one in the Tory party at the moment, is, is where you get the money from. And what Jacob Rees-Mogg seems to be, well, what we can infer from his remarks is either that it should come more from savings um, or that it should be a different kind of tax package, one that isn't passed on to workers in the form of national insurance increases. And of course, that's not the only thing going up. Corporate rates going up, tax on dividends, your council taxes are going to go up, plus your energy bills are going to rise dramatically. I'm not seeing any party right now with a, a policy, say, on energy, which is radical and dramatic to change that direction of travel in bills. Uh, what we are seeing uh, is individual policies such as Labour saying take VAT off heating bills. Well, fine, but that's only going to add to the fiscal okay. pressure, which means a tax rise elsewhere. Uh, Keir Starmer previously suggested nationalisation might be a solution, but now that he's woken up in the new year as a Blairite, that's no longer on the table. Okay. So what neither Tories or Labour are doing is taking their traditional philosophical positions, being anti-tax or pro-state, and applying it to this crisis. Instead... We're just seeing, uh, arguing over the detail. OK, Polly, is that right? Is there a lack of solutions? 
Absolutely. It's very interesting to hear that the Tories go on about we, this is a wicked, a wicked tax increase. But they don't say, and then they say, savings, he mentions. What would they cut uh, in health and social care if they don't raise that money? Or are they willing to borrow more? They never say. Uh, but there's an awful lot of talk around about how uh, we must have you know, more, more cuts and uh, less tax. But they never dare spell out, because the NHS is in a state of crisis, social care is in a crisis. I think it's the wrong tax. It shouldn't have been national insurance. It should have been income tax, which would have been much fairer, hits the, 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 those with the least less badly. Uh, or it could have come from many wealth taxes, which, uh, you know, capital gains and all sorts of other things. Matt, so wrong agree? tax, but... A tax was needed. Do you agree? So I, I, th I think Polly misrepresents the, the, the position slightly. The Tory position traditionally is that lower taxes stimulate growth and ultimately bring more into the exchequer. That, that's the fundamental premise that that, that position course, is based on. Now, and we can argue about whether that's accurate or not. Yeah, ex 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 exactly. And it's about setting that tax as low as you possibly can in order to get the money in for uh, the public services that we need. Do, do I think that uh, we're getting the balance right? I, I voted for the national insurance uh, package because. I think it's the it's the least bad option, if I can put it like that. But uh, there are obviously things that have got to be done around the cost of living. They have got to be paid for. Why is it better uh, than income tax when income tax is fairer and hits the rich more and the poorer less? Well, I think we we, we can argue about the umpteen different ways. But the question no, is, not do umpteen, we do the, the, just those two? Well, no. I, I think the the point the the point to grasp here is surely that this is something that we have settled that it has gone through what we've got to tackle today is how do we deal with uh, energy price rises how do we deal with that growing cost of living and I do think the principle of saying to uh, private companies uh, that their uh, problems can to some extent be dealt with through the market and through loans is a reasonable starting point. Stuart, um, Ed Davey the Liberal Democrat leader <coughs> has raised the prospect which you mentioned of a windfall tax on oil and gas companies what do you think of that? <laughs> You can do that when they're profitable. You can't do that when they're not profitable or not dreadfully profitable. I think more importantly, if we go back to the budget last year, the government forecast they're going to bring in an extra six billion in oil and gas revenues into the Treasury over this next three, four years. That's the pot from which any support should come from. This is additional tax the UK government did not expect. Use that as a windfall to support families with heightened energy costs. That's the way you deal with it. Matt? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think that sort of hypothecation is, is particularly necessary, but the, the, print, the principle that Stuart's suggesting that the government should be uh, supporting uh, one way or another, I, I do think there needs to be support from the, the private sector themselves, but I do think uh, it does feel as though inevitably government is, is likely to need to step in to soften what are uh, some really, really painful rises in energy prices that are outside our control. And what does that look like? Is that support for existing, boosting existing schemes uh, to help some of the families on the lowest incomes, or is that supporting the companies themselves? Well, I, th I think for me it always looks like what are, what are the levers that we've got that we can pull uh, at the moment rather than reinventing the wheel. Uh, but I, I do think the key principle that it should be targeted at people who need it most is the right one, and that's what the schemes that we have at the moment do. Well, let's just have a quick look at this story from the BBC News today. Um, Simon Jack, our business editor, says that the government's discussing fuel bill support, so that is that idea of broadening the schemes that exist for some of the families on the lowest incomes. Polly, is that enough, do you think? I think they're a bit messy, those schemes. Really, what you need is to increase universal credit. I mean, Labour introduced the tax credits. It's turned into universal credit, which is at least a reasonable mechanism by which you can reach as many people as you want, as high up the scale as you want, uh, uh, quite easily. It's already there, ready to go. You can press the button tomorrow if you want. If you want to give money, people money to cope with their bills, the machinery is there. Don't bother with these other little bits. Give them back the £20 that was taken away in the first place place and then some more for the for the energy and let it go a bit further up the scale. Tim there was quite a push in the Conservative Party to reinstate that universal credit uplift wasn't there? There was that's correct uh, the the I just keep coming back to so how in the long run do we pay for any of this I and mean, we, we still have to find the money from somewhere I'm the problem the problem is all the opposition parties are just coming up with ideas that will cost more money that will require taxation from some other area Jacob Rees Mogg has suggested there might be some savings. I actually agree with Polly. I think it's very unclear what those savings would be. And, and often when you cut down into it, you just find it involves sacking a few civil servants. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how we dig ourselves out of this hole. 
Uh, as Matt suggested, the traditional Tory approach is a supply side one. Well, we dig ourselves out. It sounds counterintuitive, but we dig ourselves out by actually cutting taxes so that you grow the economy and that brings in more money. But I didn't see anyone within government making that argument. This treasury is a high spend, high tax treasury, which, by the way, historically does not bode well for the Conservatives. The last time they tried this was in the early 90s um, and it destroyed their reputation and it helped New Labour to win the 1997 election. It actually helped Labour to um, triangulate its way around the Conservatives and present itself as a, as a lower tax party. So this is not politically, in the long run, a good look for the Conservatives. They got away with it for a short while because the country understood the price and the cost of COVID and the lockdown. But this is the year that we pay for it. And, and I think that's going to be felt politically. OK, well, you do mention COVID and I do want to talk about COVID because, of course, we know we are still in the throes of the pandemic. But let's have a look at the front page of the Daily Mail, which has uh, this headline. We have lift off Britain. It's talking about foreign travel testing rules being uh, relaxed. So it's a pretty optimistic take. So the question surely is, are you optimistic or pessimistic about where we are in the pandemic, Stuart? I want to be optimistic, but the numbers in terms of cases are incredibly high. The numbers in hospital are incredibly high. Now, the good news is that those in ICU are not going up and the mortality rate is far, far less than with the Delta strain. So I'm a bit ambivalent on whether this is all good news or all bad news. However, what we do know, with such high prevalence across the UK, particularly in London, particularly in London, it only takes a very small proportion of a very big number to suddenly have the NHS under huge pressure, uh, to have absenteeism across the whole of the economy for very good reason. So uh, I, uh, I think the jury's out on whether this is good news or bad news just yet. Polly, what's your take on it? Well, it looks like moderately good news. I mean, the NHS was already running at a sort of maximum level before the pandemic. It has kind of coped, but it copes by building up longer and longer waiting lists of people often in considerable pain. That's its release. I mean, it is overwhelmed. It was has been overwhelmed for quite a while. Uh, we hope that this is not going to be worse. We, we, we've got higher rates than we've ever had in the last few days. We hope it's not going to be worse. But he took a huge risk. I mean, when you somebody takes a risk like that, it's like saying, you know, a kid who runs across the M1 with their eyes shut, arrives the other side alive, do you congratulate them? Or do you say you were out of your mind? I mean, he did not listen to the scientists. He may get away with it. Let's hope he does. Matt? I, I, so I, I don't think that's fair. I think what we now know uh, is an awful lot more about the virus. As, as Stuart said, we've seen some much better numbers. Uh, and we also know uh, that we have that wall of defence through the vaccine. We do have far fewer people ending up in hospital, far fewer people ending up seriously ill. So it was a decision that was taken in the knowledge of all the hugely negative things that go with lockdowns and the changing nature of the virus. It's a balanced decision and, and I think it is, uh, a, 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 it, it, all these things are calculated risks, but I do think it's it's a legitimate calculation. My worry, um, if, if I'm honest, is more around levels of absenteeism in, in the NHS in particular, for, for as Stuart says, good reasons. But this is a health service that has coped heroically over the last two years. We've got a lot of people who are incredibly tired and I think trying to do everything we can to relieve that pressure on the health service um, is, is the right thing and that's why things like the catch-up fund from uh, the social care levy are, are so important. Stuart, Scotland obviously took a different approach mm. to England when it came to the Omicron variant and the restrictions that were put in place. What evidence have you got to show that that's made any difference to where Scotland's at now compared to England? Well the ONS numbers that came out in the last day or two show that the prevalence in Scotland is markedly lower well, prevalence. Yesterday's figures from the ONS show one in 15 people tested positive for COVID in England, whilst there were one in 20 in yes. Scotland. So lower, but well, not that, a massive difference well, there. Well, that's a 33% difference, 15 and then 20. However, I think what that tells us is the slightly more cautious approach taken by the First Minister has probably paid some dividends and almost certainly saved some lives. But of course, she's got to balance the needs of the NHS, the needs of public health and the needs of the economy more generally. So the decision taken yesterday to move from 10 days isolation to seven days in certain circumstances, I think was the right one. But that slightly more cautious approach 
I think was the right thing to do, and I actually agree with Polly. I think Boris Johnson's approach was very gung ho on many occasions over the past 18 months uh, to the detriment of people living in England. Tim, what do you make of that? Did the Prime Minister take a gung ho approach and do you think it's going to pay off or not? I, I, I'm very amused by Polly's metaphor of running across the road, but I don't think it's quite accurate. Uh, it's more that he was pushed across the road. Uh, Boris Johnson wanted to be uh, more cautious, but he was compelled to take a slightly more liberal approach by a mixture of the MP backbench rebellion, which was embarrassing, uh, by Lord Frost's resignation and by the cabinet confronting him. So let's not suggest that this is entirely Boris's approach. Um, it is true that, broadly speaking, while the rest of uh, the continent has largely uh, taken uh, strong lo pro-lockdown style actions, Britain has been a little more liberal. Uh, it's essentially followed a neo-Swedish approach. And although people like me still uh, rankle at the uh, attack on civil liberties, etc., we, we have really adopted a light, light, uh, light touch approach of relying more upon cit uh, uh, inviting citizens to make choices for themselves. And it seems as though many people over the course of Christmas chose to self-isolate and that will have made a difference. So that they basically chose to place themselves in a sort of lockdown. I think that the cabinet has also uh, come to the conclusion that Omicron is out there and there's probably very little you can do in order to stop the spread of it. So we might as well focus instead upon keeping the economy open and moving things uh, forward. Now, the difference between this, uh, this time and last year is the pressure on the NHS last year was coming from people being put into intensive care. It was coming from the disease itself causing ill health. This year, the pressure on the NHS is subtly different. It's probably coming more from staff being absent than it is the disease being dangerous. So the nature of the challenge has changed. We're probably starting to see COVID mutate into a gentler disease that we can live with and manage. But for the moment, its impact upon staffing means that there's still great pressure upon the NHS. So there's still cause for some degree of caution. Stuart. Nonetheless, I, th I, think we're, we're, I think it's right to be on balance optimistic. Stuart, that is a point, isn't it, that the extra restrictions in Scotland haven't prevented the pressure on the NHS or indeed things like train services where there has been real disruption? Oh, in every part of the economy throughout the UK, uh, Omicron and COVID more generally, uh, has created these pressures. That's absolutely correct. The point I was making is the slightly more cautious approach on balance, because of the lower prevalence, has probably saved lives, has probably stopped some people having to go to hospital, has probably kept more parts of the economy open than might otherwise have been the case. But we're, we're going to argue the counterfactual all day long because until the assessment is done in 10 years' time, that's pretty unprovable. But I think that slightly more cautious approach has paid dividends. I think what is provable is how much Nicola Sturgeon Moore has been trusted for mm. taking a more precautionary attitude. Whether it actually, as you say, statistically works out in the end, we don't know. But certainly, politically, it's felt the right thing to do because the people have always been more cautious than the government in Westminster, much more cautious than, thank goodness, than yeah. uh, uh, Boris Johnson. Do you accept that? I, I think people are very uh, tired of the restrictions that we're currently still to some extent living uh, under. So, so, I, so I think while uh, Polly's obviously right that uh, the, the public have generally been uh, more pro-lockdown than uh, some of my colleagues in Parliament, actually I think that's changed quite a lot and I think uh, where we're now seeing much better numbers, particularly in, in ICU, uh, then the focus r rightly shifts to the backlog, to all the other conditions that, that Polly rightly talked about and people start to think about those rather than COVID itself. I think uh, that being cautious is something that the public view has shifted on quite significantly. Okay. But there's still a majority for caution. OK. Yeah, but I think the nature of what we define of ca as caution <coughs> has changed to some extent. Well, I fear the pandemic will rumble some time and so too will the discussions. But I want to move on because George Eustace, the Environment Secretary, has been giving a speech today in which he's been setting out tax set payer support for farmers post-Brexit. We are now joined by Claire Marshall, who is our Environment and Rural Affairs correspondent. So, Claire, tell us, what is the plan? Well, this is the biggest change to the countryside and farming for the last 60 years. Um, and so it's going to change everything. I'm on a dairy farm at the moment and what decisions the farmer takes here is going to change over what's decided. So what George Eustace has been setting out is the changes to happen now we've left the European Union. So under the Common Agricultural Policy, farmers would largely be paid around 
the amount of land that they owned. This is now changing to focus around environmental benefits. So at the moment, you've already got details about a sust general sustaining, sustainable farming policy that was announced in December. Um, what's being set out today is two further schemes that farmers, essentially they're pots of money that farmers and landowners can apply for. One of them is on a local level, so on individual farms or if you've got individual pieces of land. There are schemes that you could do maybe to plant uh, habitat for nesting birds or create some wetlands. And then you've got this much bigger scale pot of money coming, which is for much broader schemes. So uh, rewilding vast areas of land or taking care of peatland. Um, and they're saying that is particularly ambitious and radical. And George Eustace hopes that around 15 of these pilot projects will be announced this year. So it's completely changing what the countryside will look like. Claire, I failed to appreciate your farming background there, which is rather lovely. Uh, but just tell us, what do farmers themselves make of this? How does it compare to what they were receiving under the Common Agricultural Policy? There is real confusion among farmers, I have to say, at the moment. The, these details about their futures are, are still being really slow to be, to be emerged, to be let out. Um, the farmer who owns this farm says he's really, really worried about food production. We've got dairy, dairy cows, uh, calves behind me. There's still no indication about, well, in their view, about how important that is. They feel that that is actually being lost at the moment. They say that it's, it's all about the environment, which many farmers care about already. So where is food production in all that? Um, and one crucial issue, which, which seems kind of obvious when you think about it for a while, is that if farmers in the UK have to adhere to these new environmental standards around which they're going to be paid in the future or supported in the future, will that lead to cheaper food imports from abroad? And what about the environmental standards in those countries abroad? So you may have farmers meet, reaching a very high level here, but if you want cheap beef from, from Brazil, for example, farmers there adhere to very different standards. So a lot of farmers are behind the kind of general shift towards the environment. But what does that mean for, for food production? They feel, a lot of them feel that's being lost in all the chat. OK, Claire, I mean, the dairy cows, thank you very much. Um, Matt, your thoughts on that point, that actually is this emphasis on environmental sustainability going to damage British food farming production? Well, I think the em emphasis on the environment is, is hugely welcome. As, as your correspondent said, it's something that farmers have always cared uh, passionately about. And the previous uh, regime focused, I think, quite narrowly on biodiversity rather than on this broader package. So, so I think a lot of that um, is welcome. I think on that broader question, though, of trade deals, we've always had incredibly high standards in the UK and we've always uh, adhered to them. Uh, that has not been uh, undermined by, pre by the previous previous uh, regime of, of imports, and I don't think there's any indication that it will be now. But uh, now that we do have that greater freedom to go off and do our own trade deals, as we've been doing really quite successfully so far, uh, then it is something to rightly watch out for. I think no one would like to see uh, those standards diluted. I don't see any hint of that for a Mamre Trevelyan at, at uh, international trade, for instance. And so I think it is an important uh, concern. The devil is in the detail, but there will be more of that emerging in due course. On this shift though towards this emphasis on farmers getting funding because of the uh, environmentally sustainable mm. methods of farming or change of land use, what are farmers in your constituency telling you about what that means for what they're able to produce on their farms and how economically viable British farming will be as a consequence? Well, so, so mine's a, a big agricultural area but it is very much uh, sort of large scale industrial far uh, farming. What they're saying uh, to me insofar as they've been able to digest this uh, so so far is, is broadly genuinely that it's good news and I know there's a bit of he would say that wouldn't he in, in, in that but genuinely that focus on being able to uh, put for instance more trees and hedgerows that that sort of stuff which might sound relatively trivial but done at large scale makes a big difference wetlands again and, and being paid to store water in a constituency like mine that is uh, at huge risk of flooding uh, all year round those sorts of changes um, immensely welcome and that's why getting the detail out there will be so important. Stuart of of course, Scotland is now also in charge of agricultural policy, now I've left the European Union. So what is the plan for farmers in Scotland? Well, we were always in charge of agricultural policy. It's just that the CAP and some of this other land use funding came direct from Europe and the Scottish Government And you have to abide by European rules. Oh, indeed. Distributed. Indeed, indeed. And the, U the rest of the UK did likewise. So, in Scotland we've already changed this to some extent, that much of the funding now comes 
with green strings attached. It sounded quite similar to what George Eustace was saying in the package, but let's just see what the detail is, because the criticism I've picked up is that every single commentator speaking about this had said, we haven't seen any of the detail. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with a big pot of money for a small number of large pilots for land uh, redesignation. Let's see how that's allocated and it's not part of some kind of power grab. We have another pot of money for a larger number of small-scale environmental improvements. I think that might be very welcome, but again, let's see what the detail says. But the bit about food production and food quality, and this is where I have to disagree profoundly, in every one of the trade deals in the last Parliament that came before Parliament, we and all the opposition parties made a determined pitch to ensure food production standards for imported food were on a par with those in the UK. And the Tories rejected that at every single turn. So I think farmers are absolutely right to be concerned that they could be undermined with food imports with much lower food production standards. And I, I worry dreadfully about that. Matt? Uh, so so I, th I think I'd, I'd make the same argument that was made in Parliament at the time, which is, of course, it's right to be worried about this stuff. Um, putting it in on the face of the bill, on the face of, on the face of a trade deal, in, in the way that it has been attempted, I simply don't think is the right mechanism uh, so to what go mechanism about it. So, so what would you do to protect farmers here from being unfairly uh, competed against by food imports with lower quality production standards. What mechanism would you use? Well, I think putting my, the point more broadly is that the economy of uh, moving food around the world, we've seen New Zealand lamb, for instance, has not uh, squeezed out all lamb production in, in the UK, and that's been here for a very long time. So I think it's about saying some of this stuff that is sensible. so complacent in terms of the New Deal. Speak to any Welsh sheep farmer. Speak to Scottish hill farmers. Oh, absolutely. They are petrified about this well, because you're allowing why. this stuff in with no concern for well, marginal well, sheep farmers yeah, throughout that's, the UK. That's, I mean, that's, that's plainly not true. There are very long transition periods built into these deals because of exactly those concerns. So I, I think, to be honest, um, there is we, we have more in common here uh, than, than perhaps we like to admit. There are, there are real concerns. They are addressed in things like transition periods. Uh, and, and that's because uh, I think there is a middle ground that sees us having better trading well, relationships we rule, around we the world. Well, then we rule out an American trade deal. Uh, just forget it. If, if we're not willing to lower our standards, that's the crunch point. At some point or another, you're going to have okay. to make a decision. Well, that's one the way point or the of the negotiation. Okay. Right? Well, well, no, it's not negotiable. Polly, you did mention America, and so I do want to, you to cast your minds back to a year ago. Take a look at this. <clears throat> this was exactly a year ago today, and these were the images that were coming out of Washington that had a lot of people... Uh, gripped, a lot of people shocked. These were Trump supporters storming the building as Congress was meeting to certify Joe Biden's presidential election victory. Uh, now, our correspondent Gabriel Gatehouse, who works for BBC Newsnight, has been uh, putting together a podcast on this where he's been looking at some of the origins, what led up to that. Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Just tell us a little bit about your take on it. Well, so I got into this because uh, when January the 6th happened, I was back here in London. I'd been covering the election uh, in the US in November, uh, but I was back here in London. I was watching uh, the TV, those pictures you just showed uh, of the mob storming the Capitol building, and suddenly I saw someone I recognised. It was that guy with horns on his head, draped in furs, bare-chested tattoos, his face painted. And I thought, my God, I met that guy two months previously in Arizona, in just in the aftermath of the election. And the story that he told me then was one that was frankly so implausible, so weird, um, that I decided this is too weird to put in a news report. So I chatted to him. I didn't film an interview with him because the story he told was essentially the story of this conspiracy theory called QAnon, um, which was part of what drove uh, those protesters into the Capitol. It wasn't the only factor, but it was part of it. And that theory, completely unfounded, is that a cabal of Satan-worshipping paedophiles was involved in a plot to unseat Donald Trump and that they um, had essentially stolen the election. Now, uh, I tried to trace the origins of this conspiracy theory. Where did it come from? How did it get into this guy's head? Gabriel, just tell us, where are we now compared to where we were a year ago, do you think? 
Well, in terms of QAnon, uh, Q, this mysterious poster who was posting about all this stuff, has disappeared. But the ideas that they implanted in the American psyche are still very much alive. So if you look at recent polling, um, I think around a third of all Americans believe that uh, the election was stolen or illegitimate or that the American electoral system is somehow flawed to the extent that they can't um, trust the outcomes of elections. And that really is the fundamentally dangerous thing here. Because um, if, you, if you lose an election, you, you disagree with your opponents, you lose an election, you think, OK, I'll campaign differently or harder and maybe I'll win next time. But if you believe that your opponents are evil, and that they are um, fiddling the system to keep you out of power, then people start looking at other options. And, and, and I think the fear is that um, because the, a certain wing of the, of the Republican Party and Trump's supporters, who are still very strong, are still pushing this idea that the election um, was stolen, that the genie, in a sense, is out of the bottle, and that you will get these claims of a stolen election every time you have an election. OK, Gabriel, thank you. Polly, I want to get your thoughts on this because um, the Joe Biden presidency was meant to be a bit of a reset after Donald Trump. Do you think that's happened? Well, it's very hard because the American Constitution makes it almost impossible for any president to get anything through at all. So, uh, you know, it's been very narrow in the houses and he hasn't been able to get as many of his policies through, but he's got a very big reform package through. I think what's alarming is that the number of serious American commentators you hear now actually thinking that they're on the verge of civil war for the reasons that Gabriel spelt out. And I think that's terrifying. It wouldn't be exactly like the last civil war because it's not geographical. It's dotted all over the country. But that violence, you know, if a third of people think the democracy doesn't work uh, and are willing to resort to violence, I think we may be in for episodes of appalling terrorism uh, and from the far right and very, very difficult to cope with. Tim, what are your thoughts? There were, of course, also riots in the run-up to the Capitol Hill attack, which you could characterize as being from the far left. I'd say that uh, political violence is a part of the American political fabric. I think all the way back to the Whiskey Rebellion or Nat Turner or John Brown's raid on Harper Ferry. Conspiracy thinking is part of the American fabric. Conspiracies around who killed JFK or fluoride in the water or McCarthyism. Um, our distrust of the uh, state is part of the American fabric. Um, and, I, and so sadly, I, I see the Capitol Hill attack really as a culmination of things, as a symptom of a number of different factors, which you can find on left and right, which are tragically part of the American okay. character. And of course, it, yep, there has been a civil war before. Would there be one again? I don't know. I don't, I don't think it would have the same character as before. Okay. But it, it works to the advantage of... No, I, I didn't have much time before. It works to the advantage of both left and right, unfortunately, to play up political tensions. I'm sorry, it to rush you. We're, we're very up against it. I just want to get a quick thought from Stuart. Um, Trump has actually been strengthened as opposed to weakened by what happened, it seems. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's true. The thing that go. concerns me most about this, uh, absolutely concerns me, is that there are now elements within the Republican Party who, if they have a good midterm election, may actually seek to stop the investigation into this insurrection and are trying to change the narrative from these are a bunch of nutters dressed up in horns and face paint pretending Satanists, Satanists, are trying to steal an election. They're trying to turn these people into good old patriots. This is madness. Let the investigation okay. run its course and let the judges and the courts put these people in the jail. Very brief word, Matt, please. I, I'd simply say they were horrific scenes, but in some ways the most horrific part of it is seeing mainstream figures egging people on. That's okay. what can't be acceptable. OK, briefly want to show you this. Tweets this afternoon were expecting exchange of letters about the Downing Street flat refurbishment between Lord Guy and Boris Johnson, so keep your eyes peeled. But that is all from us today. Tomorrow at 12.15 we'll be back with Politics UK and Politics Live will be back on Monday. <laughs>